fully half say they have depression or anxiety. And most worrying of all, the biggest proportional increase in economic inactivity due to long-term sickness came from young people, those in the prime of their life, just starting out on work and family, instead parked on welfare. Now, we should see it as a sign of progress, of course, that people can talk openly about mental health conditions in a way that years ago would have been unthinkable. And I will never dismiss or downplay the illnesses people have. Anyone who has suffered mental ill health or had family and friends who have knows that these conditions are real and they matter. But just as it would be wrong to dismiss this growing trend, so it would be wrong to merely sit back and accept it. Because it's too hard, too controversial, or for fear of causing offence. Doing so would let down many of the people our welfare system was designed to help. Because if you believe, as I do, that work gives you the chance not just to earn, but to contribute, to belong, to overcome feelings of loneliness and social isolation, and if you believe, as I do, the growing body of evidence that good work can actually improve mental and physical health, then it becomes clear we need to be more ambitious about helping people back to work and more honest about the risk of over-medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life. Fail to address this, and we risk not only letting those people down, but creating a deep sense of unfairness amongst those whose taxes fund our social safety net in a way that risks undermining trust and consent in that very system. We can't stand for that. And of course, the situation as it is, is economically unsustainable. We can't lose so many people from our workforce whose contributions could help to drive growth. And there's no sustainable way to achieve our goal of bringing down migration levels, which are just too high, without giving more of our own people the skills, incentives, and support to get off welfare and back into work. And we can't afford such a spiraling increase in the welfare bill and the irresponsible burden that will place on this and future generations of taxpayers. We now spend £69 billion on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. Let me just repeat that. If we do not change, it will increase by more than 50% in just four years. That's not right. It's not sustainable, and it's not fair on the taxpayers who fund it. So, in the next parliament, a Conservative government will significantly reform and control welfare. Now, this is not about making our safety net less generous, or imposing a blanket freeze on all benefits, as some have suggested. I'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable. Instead, the critical questions are about eligibility, about who should be entitled to support, and what kind of support best matches their needs. And to answer these questions, I want to set out today five conservative reforms for a new welfare settlement for Britain. First, we must be more ambitious in assessing people's potential for work. Right now, the gateway to ill health benefits is writing too many off, leaving them on the wrong type of support and with no expectation of trying to find a job with all the advantages that that brings. In 2011, 20% of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. That's wrong. People are not three times sicker than they were a decade ago. And the world of work has changed dramatically. Now, of course, those with serious debilitating conditions should never be expected to work. But if you have a low-level mobility issue, your employer could make reasonable adjustments, perhaps including adaptations to enable you to work from home. And if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and treatment you need to manage your condition. But that doesn't mean 
we should assume you can't engage in work. That's not going to help you. And it's not fair on everyone else either. So we're going to tighten up the work capability assessment such that hundreds of thousands of benefit recipients with less severe conditions will now be expected to engage in the world of work and be supported to do so. Second, just as we help move people from welfare into work, we've got to do more to stop people going from work to welfare. Now, the whole point of replacing the sick note with the fit note was to stop so many people just being signed off as sick. Instead of being told you're not fit for work, the fit note provided the option to say that you may be fit for work with advice about what you can do and what adaptions or support would enable you to stay in or return to work quickly. 11 million of these fit notes were issued last year alone. But what proportion was signed may be fit for work? Just 6%. That's right. A staggering 94% of those signed off sick were simply written off as not fit for work. Well, that's not right. And it was never the intention we don't just need to change the sick note, we need to change the sick note culture so that the default becomes what work you can do, not what you can't. Building on the pilots that we've already started, we're going to design a new system where people have easy and rapid access to specialised work and health support to help them back to work from the very first fit note conversation. And part of the problem is that it may not be reasonable to ask GPs who are perfectly very busy at the moment, assess whether their own patients are fit for work. It too often puts them in an impossible situation where they know that refusal to sign somebody off will harm that precious relationship with their patient. So we're also going to test shifting the responsibility for assessment from GPs and giving it to specialist work and health professionals who have the dedicated time to provide an objective assessment of someone's ability to work and the tailored support that they need to do so. Third, for those who could work with the right support, we should have higher expectations of them in return for receiving benefits. Because when the taxpayer is supporting you to get back on your feet, you have an obligation to put in the hours. And if you do not make that effort, you can't expect the same level of benefits. It used to be that if you worked just nine hours a week, you'd get full benefits without needing to look for additional work. That's not right, because if you can work more, you should. So we're changing the rules. Anyone working less than half a full-time week will now have to try and find extra work in return for claiming benefits, and will accelerate moving people from legacy benefits onto universal credit to give them more access to the world of work. Now, one of my other big concerns about the system is that the longer you stay on welfare, the harder it can be to go back to work. Around half a million people have been unemployed for six months, and well over a quarter of a million have been unemployed for 12 months. These are people with no medical conditions that prevent them from working, and who will have benefited from intensive employment support and training programs, there is no reason these people should not be in work, especially when we have almost a million job vacancies. So we will now look at options to strengthen our regime. Anyone who doesn't comply with the conditions set by their work coach, such as accepting an available job, will, after 12 months, have their claim closed and their benefits removed entirely because unemployment support should be a safety net, never a lifestyle choice. Fourth, we need to match the support people need to the actual conditions they have and help people live independently and remove the barriers they face. But we need to look again at how we do this through personal independence payments. I worry about it being misused. Now, its purpose is to contribute to the extra costs people face as they go about their daily lives. Take, for example, those who need money for aids or assistance with things like handrails or stair lifts. Often they're already available at low cost or free from the NHS or local authorities. And they're one-off costs. So it probably isn't right that we're paying an ongoing amount every year. 
We also need to look specifically at the way personal independence payments support those with mental health conditions. Since 2019, the number of people claiming PIP, citing anxiety or depression as their main condition, has doubled, with over 5,000 new awards on average every single month. But for all the challenges they face, it's not clear they have the same degree of increased living costs as those with physical conditions. And the whole system is undermined by the way people are asked to make subjective and unverifiable claims about their capability. So in the coming days, we will publish a consultation on how we move away from that to a more objective and rigorous approach that focuses support on those with the greatest needs and extra costs. We will do that by being more precise about the type and severity of mental health conditions that should be eligible for PIP. We'll consider linking that assessment more closely to a person's actual condition and requiring greater medical evidence to substantiate a claim. All of which will make the system fairer and harder to exploit. And we'll also consider whether some people with mental health conditions should get PIP in the same way through cash transfers or whether they'd actually be better supported to lead happier, healthier and more independent lives through access to treatment like talking therapies or respite care. I want to be completely clear about what I'm saying here. This is not about making the welfare system less generous to people who face very real extra costs from mental health conditions. For those with the greatest needs, we actually want to make it easier to access with fewer requirements. And beyond the welfare system, we're delivering the largest expansion in mental health services in a generation, with almost £5 billion of extra funding over the past five years, and a near doubling of mental health training places. But our overall approach is about saying that people with less severe mental health conditions should be expected to engage in the world of work. And fifth, we can't allow fraudsters to exploit the natural compassion and generosity of the British people. We've already cracked down on thousands of people wrongly claiming universal credit, including those not self-reporting earnings or hiding capital. And we'll save the taxpayer £600 million by legislating to access vital data from third parties like banks. Just this month, DWP secured guilty verdicts against a Bulgarian gang, court making around six thousand fraudulent claims, including by hiding behind a corner shop in North London. And we're going further. We're using all the developments in modern technology, including artificial intelligence, to crack down on exploitation in the welfare system that's taking advantage of the hard-working taxpayers who fund it. We are preparing a new fraud bill for the next parliament, which will align DWP with HMRC so that we treat benefit fraud like tax fraud with new powers to make seizures and arrests and will also enable penalties to be applied to a wider set of fraudsters through a new civil penalty. Because when people see others in their community gaming the system that their taxes pay, it erodes support for the very principle of the welfare state. Now, in conclusion, some people, no doubt, will hear this speech and accuse me of lacking compassion, of not understanding the barriers people face in their everyday lives. But the exact opposite is true. There is nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. And there is nothing fair about expecting taxpayers to support those who could work, but choose not to. It doesn't have to be like this. We can change. We must change. The opportunities to work are there, thanks to an economic plan that has created almost a million job vacancies. The rewards for working are there, thanks to our tax cuts and increases to the national living wage. And now, if we can deliver the vision for welfare that I've set out today, then we can finally fulfil our moral mission to restore hope and give back to everyone who can the dignity, purpose and meaning that comes from work. Thank you.
thank you. So we've got lots of time for some questions from the media. I'd like to try and get through as many as we can. So if I could ask you to try and keep it to one question, that will help. Uh, and if I could start with ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, on personal independence payments, 1.9 million people with mental health issues are currently sitting on a waiting list. Surely that's not the right moment to float replacing their cash benefits with access to treatment that they'll be worried they can't get. And I'm sorry, but I do just want to ask for a response to the Israeli strikes on Iran. Yeah, um, thanks, Anishka. We take mental health incredibly seriously, which is why we're investing record amounts into mental health services and treatment. If you look at what's happened, funding for mental health services has actually exceeded the increase that was set out a few years ago in the NHS's long-term plan. So it went up 10% last year. NHS mental health services are right now treating a record number of adults. We've rolled out mental health support in communities, in schools, and our actually world-leading talking therapies um, has been given extra funding and has, I think, a very successful recovery rate, and that's being expanded to more people. And we're preparing for the long term as well. The recently announced long-term workforce plan for the NHS trains a near, well, a near doubling of the number of mental health nurse training places are created through that. So I think that should give you a sense of our commitment to supporting those with mental health conditions, as I said, record amounts going in and a plan to continually expand them. Um, but I do think it's, it's right to make sure that our welfare system is supporting those who need it the most in the way that we intended it to. And you just have to look at the numbers. You know, over half of all the people who joined that group of the economically inactive last year uh, were citing mental health or anxiety as the main reason. Now, of course, we want to get people the support and the treatment they need uh, with those conditions. Uh, but I do think it's right that the welfare system doesn't over medicalize you know, the everyday challenges and worries of life, especially because I believe very strongly in the evidence support work is good for people's mental health, right? There's increasing evidence and cite a range of different studies that actually people being in work see huge improvements in their overall health and especially their mental health. So we're letting those people down if we persist with a system which at the moment is writing far too many of them off as just simply not able to work, when we know that work will be very good for them. And you've seen this massive increase since the pandemic, most worryingly, I think for all of us amongst young people, and that can't be right. right? That's an enormous loss of potential, and we don't want to lose all those people's potential. We want to support them so that they can have, as I described, you know, the purpose, the meaning, the hope that comes from good work. And that's why I think it is right to look again at how the work capability assessment works, and that's why we're going to tighten up the conditions there, but also how PIP supports those with mental health conditions. And it is, I think, the right thing to consider whether those people with less severe conditions do, of course, get the treatment and support they need, and the right way to do that might not be through cash transfers. And it may also not be the case that the system, as it is set up today, in the way that it treats people with this one-size-fits-all model is actually doing the right thing. There's a range of conditions and severities that people have and the impact on their daily living costs. And we need to be a bit more specific about that and actually ask ourselves, well, hang on, is everyone seeing these extra costs in their day-to-day -day living in the same way, particularly when it comes to mental health conditions? And I think, as I said, the numbers speak for themselves. If we don't do anything, the PIP bill alone is forecast to increase by 50% in just four years. And I don't think anyone sitting here thinks that is right, sustainable, or fair. Um, and as I said, particularly when we think that work is good for people, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to, tr uh, to try and tackle this in the way that I've set out. Um, that with the situation overnight, uh, as you would appreciate, it's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Uh, next, we go to LBC. 
thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask, Job Centre staff have already reported across the country unsustainable workloads and huge backlogs. Under this plan, they're going to have 400,000 more people to support into work. That is a lot of people. Are you confident that they're going to be able to manage that? And I have to ask as well, should Mark Menzies quit as an MP? So on, uh, let me just take the second one first. It's right that Mark en Menzies has resigned the Conservative whip. He's been suspended from his position as a trade envoy whilst the investigations into those allegations continue. You know, for our part, I can't comment on our ongoing investigation while it's happening. And uh, he's no longer a Conservative MP, as I said. Now, with regard to, to work coaches, they do a fantastic job, actually. And they deserve an enormous amount of our praise um, for what they do. Because um, they're doing something actually incredible. I mean, they are transforming people's lives, right? Moving someone off welfare into work is an incredibly special moment, right? And any of us who have worked with them and heard about those stories or talked to constituents, colleagues in our communities who have made that transition will know what an incredible moment it is. Ian and I were talking about that just before we came in, and Ian's spoken about it so eloquently in the past. You know, work is an enormous force for good. You know, I believe this very strongly. It actually, when I first created the furlough scheme and people asked me about it, what drove me to do that was my belief in the fundamental importance of work to people's lives. It gives you purpose. It gives you dignity. It gives you pride. It gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, it gives you hope. And it's not just about, obviously, the financial security that it brings. It's about all those other things that strengthen your life. And, you know, we don't get anywhere in life without working, whether it's individuals, our family, or indeed the country. That's why, you know, I created the furlough scheme because jobs are so important to me. And it's why this agenda for welfare reform is so important to me. And the people on the front line who are doing it are our work coaches. They are the people that are supporting people into work and they deserve an enormous amount of thanks and praise for everything they do and rightly championed by Mel. And Mel uh, has worked really well with the Chancellor to secure extra funding for all our uh, job coaches and our um, job centres and our work coaches. Ian talked about things like universal support uh, in his opening remarks. So actually, we've invested probably over the last two or three budgets and fiscal events, literally billions of pounds into new programmes that go into supporting our work coaches. You know, Mel could explain all the details afterwards. There's universal support, there's work well. All of these things essentially provide work coaches with more resources, more work coaches to support more people, to help them into work. So we've approached this from lots of different ways. It's not just about reforms of the welfare system. It's about proactive support, wraparound support. We've also invested in training as well. So actually, for all the people that we want to help, they have now access to completely free training, level two, level three qualifications, skills boot camps, all of these initiatives designed to help them get into work. So we are wrapping our arms around these people and helping them with everything that we've got. And we're also using new technology. And I talked a little bit about AI on the fraud side, but we're also <coughs> using technology to act as a co-pilot, essentially, for work coaches uh, so that it can make their lives easier. And we've already started rolling that out. The results are incredible in the amount of time that it saves work coaches. We've got more to do. But that's why it's so important that you've got, in this government, a government that understands the potential of technology to transform public services. You know, we all want more out of public services and we'd all prefer to pay less taxes. You know, one way to square that circle is to make sure that we use technology to drive up productivity. And actually, the work Mel's doing across our job centres is a great example of that. And that's only going to improve over time. Uh, and that's why actually yes, using AI and other technologies, making work coaches' life easier, saving them uh, from the bureaucracy that some of the they're going through with the forms, um, is paying real dividends and, and will only make life easier going forward. Uh, next, we go to the BBC. Vicky Young, BBC. Um, could you talk a bit more about the fit notes and the changes you want to make? Uh, who is going to do this instead of GPs? Are there professionals? What training will they get? How will you recruit them, given that there does seem to be an issue with recruitment in uh, the NHS at the moment? And if you're going to have a more tailored service, that will, of course, take up more time and be more complicated. Isn't that going to just add to the backlog? And uh, secondly, why did you wait so long before acting on the serious allegations about Mark Menzies? 
So on, on Mark Menzies, I've already addressed that, and I've said there's an ongoing investigation, so I can't really comment whilst that's ongoing. On, on the fit note, the broader point here, before we get into the practicalities of what we're doing is the why, and it's just to remind everyone of what I said, right? When, this, when we went from a sick note to fit note, the whole point was we were trying to say, hang on, there, there's lots of work people may be able to do. Right? And we need flexibility in this gateway to focus on what people can do, not what they can't. Uh, but that hasn't happened. As I said, 94% of the 11 million fit notes last year were not fit for work. Right? So this idea that we would have more flexibility, focus more on what people may be able to do, hasn't happened. And that's why I think it's right that we look at this. Um, so there are, we've already started pilots. And so Mel's already been rolling out some pilots across the country to trial different ways in local areas. Uh, today, we're publishing our call for evidence, because I'm not saying I'm standing here today with the precise answer of what it's going to look like, but we're going to ask people's views. We're going to trial a range of different things. But I do think that there is a argument for moving away, as I said, from GPs doing this, who obviously there's a lot of demands on GPs, um, and it may be that this is better done by other professionals. Also, as I said, GPs have a quite special relationship with their patients, and inserting this into it puts them sometimes in a, you talk to them in a difficult position because they don't want to damage that relationship with their patient, and it may be harder for them to, to be as objective. And I know, actually, I think the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners has, has kind of welcomed the call for evidence today. So that we want to explore different, different models. Uh, there's a range of different options you can do, but we want to figure out, well, what's a system that's efficient, um, that's got the right number, you know, the right expertise and skills of people to make these objective assessments, and do it in a way that is fair, that is also focused on figuring out what people can do, not what they can't, so that we change the culture around this whole, uh, this whole process. Um, so that, that, that's the approach on fit notes. As I said, uh, call for evidence is published today, um, but I think there's a very strong argument for changing our current system because it's not delivering on the aims that it originally set out to deliver. And you know, I, as I said, if you believe, like me, work is a good thing, we've got to have a system and a culture that recognizes that and encourages it, and the current fit note system, unfortunately, is not delivering that for any of us. Uh, next, we go to GB News. Uh, Christopher Hope from GB News. Prime Minister, um, is this sick note culture a generational thing? Are you basically saying that Britain's got to pull itself together, get back to work, to older people to get on with it, and younger people don't want to? I can ask you a question about the Rwanda flights. You now won't say these flights will take off by the end of spring. Will you say whether they'll take off by the end of the summer? So on this question of mental health, I just want to be really clear. I'm not in any way saying that mental health isn't a serious condition. Of course it is. And that's why, as I outlined earlier, we've invested a record amount in it, record amount of people getting treated for it. And it is a very welcome thing that we all can talk and acknowledge mental health issues in a way that we wouldn't or couldn't have done a decade ago. Uh, and look, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and the treatment that you need to manage your conditions. But that doesn't mean that we should assume you can't engage in the world of work, because that isn't going to help you when all the evidence says that work can be good for your mental health. And what we need to not do is risk over these things when it comes to the welfare system and, and over what are essentially the everyday challenges and anxieties of life. Right? That is distinct from a welfare system that recognises people with severe conditions need very specific help and support. You know, for lots of other people with less severe conditions, they can and should be expected to engage in the world of work. And that's why we're going to reform um, the work capability assessments again and look at how PIP treats these conditions. Uh, but this point on young people is important. And I said it should worry all of us. The biggest proportional increase in the group of people who have become economically inactive since the pandemic is young people. Right? That is a tragedy. Right? I, it's enormous waste and loss of human potential. And so as a matter of urgency, we should be wanting to tackle that. And as I said, if you believe very strongly as I do that work is good for people, particularly early in their careers and life, then we must look at reforming this system because how it's working at the moment, forget about what it's doing on the money and everything else and it's unsustainable and bad for the economy, it is fundamentally letting these people down um, if we are writing them off rather than helping them get into work because that's probably one of the most positive things we can do for them. Uh, on, on Rwanda, look, the, the very simple thing here is, is that repeatedly 
everyone has tried to block us from getting this bill through. And, uh, you know, yet again, you saw it this week. Um, you saw, you know, Labour peers blocking us again. And that's enormously frustrating. Everyone's patience with this has run uh, thin. Mine certainly has. Uh, so our intention now is to get this done on Monday. No more prevarication, no more delay. We are going to get this done on Monday and we will sit there and vote until it's done. I think everyone will be able to see that, that there's a clear choice here. You've got a Conservative government that is doing absolutely everything it can to pass this bill so that after that we soon as practically possible can get flights to leave to Rwanda and build that deterrent so that we can stop the boats and you've got a Labour Party that is doing absolutely everything it can to delay and frustrate in the, us in that aim. I think the British people can see that very clearly, but we're not deterred. We're going to do everything we can to stop the boats. And get, as I said, look, the priority now is to get this bill passed, right? At the end of the day, like, we've got to get this bill passed. And I said now very clearly, we're going to get this done on Monday. We don't want any more prevarication or delay. Enough from the Labour Party. We're going to get this bill passed and then we will work to get flights off so we can build that deterrent because that is the only way to resolve this issue. If you care about stopping the boats, you've got to have a deterrent. You've got to have somewhere that you can send people so that they know if they come here illegally, they won't get to stay. It's as simple as that. The bill is the way we're going to deliver that. Uh, next, we'll go to the Daily Mail. Thanks, PM. Uh, Jason goes from the Daily Mail. Um, you, you talk in your speech about uh, removing benefits entirely from uh, long-term unemployed who won't take a job. Um, I mean, that could leave some people destitute. Some of your critics are going to say... The uh, Prime Minister uh, continuing uh, the Q&A session after his remarks at the uh, Centre of Social Justice, where he announced uh, planned reforms uh, uh, to the welfare state, created, saying that uh, he had, quote, a moral mission to make sure hard work is rewarded. Uh, also saying on Rwanda, everyone's trying to block us, but no more delay. We will get this done on Monday. Only one... A uh, brief answer uh, given uh, so far on the latest situation in the Middle East. He said, it wouldn't be right for me to speculate on reports of uh, an Israeli attack on Iran. Uh, he said he was waiting for more information on that uh, and working with his allies. He said, quote, Israel has the right to defend itself, uh, that we want to see calm heads prevail uh, and significant escalation in the Middle East is not in... Right. And these are people who don't have any medical condition that bars them from working. These are people who've benefited from all the support that Mel has put in place and Gillian's put in place with the skill side. So there's enormous amount of support for these people. No medical conditions why they can't work. And yet we have, as I said, half a million of them who are kind of on benefits for a long time. Right. And I worry very much about benefits becoming a lifestyle choice. That is not good, obviously not good for the economy, not good for the public finances and taxpayers. It's not fair, but it's not good for those people if you believe, like I do, that work is the best way to improve their lives. And you talk about their financial circumstances.